In the book of Revelation, and this is not a Bible study right now, we could talk just about the first five chapters for the next six months. The first chapter deals with a little bit of the past, the history. Then chapters two and three of Revelation deal with the seven letters that were sent to seven churches, real churches, like literal churches like Laodicea, David, yes. And so that dealt with the present. And then chapter four begins to the end of the book with the future. And there's no greater way that I could think of for John to bring us in to what's going to happen next than to bring worship and praise and power and glory to the one who is altogether worthy. I love, I love what was read by Mike and Donna, chapter 4 and chapter 5. The 24 elders cast their crowns in chapter 4 at the feet of Jesus, crying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Is He worthy, church? Yes. Yeah. I really, you know, I, I, I'm so excited when I think about the worthiness of God. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of our sacrifices. He's worthy of our prayers. He's worthy. No one else is worthy. There's only one name, as Glenn read, and we'll get to that, that is above every name. The beautiful name of what? Who, church? Jesus. Jesus. Very good. Jesus. Name all the potentates or emperors or czars or kings or queens or Caesars down through the ages. And when you made your list, make room for one name above the name you put on the top of your list, and that name is Jesus Christ. There is no name. There is no power. There is no principality. There is no authority greater more powerful, more dominant, more significant than the glorious and beautiful name of our Savior. Amen. I need to ask you a question that only you can answer, and it's not, uh, you don't need to reply verbally, or it's, it's a question between you and Jesus. When you hear the name Jesus. Does, is there something that goes through you almost like an electric current? The name of Jesus. I can hear the name David, and I don't care. I, <laughs> no, I'm teasing David. More truth. Amen. Good preaching. Hold that thought. I'll come back to you, buddy. <laughs> Don't lose your thought. I know you get derailed. I'm coming back to you. I can go back in the Old Testament and think of a king named David. And I'm full of, oh, I, I guess, honor. I love to honor that name. And I will when I get to heaven. But his name can't save me. No. His name can't justify me. His name can't turn my way around from, from hell bound to heaven bound. As great as King David was, David's name he, he doesn't of, do anything. He had a lot of problems, but, but like, the, Lord, the Lord worked it out. Yes. Like the name of Jesus. Think about that. Donna, are you still in Revelation? Donna, are you still in the book of Revelation? Yeah. Could you turn back to those, that last verse you read, I just want to go over that again. In that loud voice they were saying, Yes. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Amen. Why, Donna? Why? Because He is worthy. He's worthy, church. I looked up the name Robert, a beautiful name, but you know something I found out? The name Robert cannot save you. 
dukes and earls of Scotland were named Robert. But none of them can take you from the guttermost and lift you to the uttermost. Only one name can do that. The name Robert, I did. I thought it meant wisdom, but I was wrong in my stupidity. It means bright shining one. I knew my mom misnamed me. I can tell by the looks on your faces. <laughs> but many, many years ago, would you follow me back 2,030 years ago about to when Mary and Joseph found out that Mary was with child? And usually the parents name the child. The mother names the child. But not so in this case. The angel said, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Above his name, church, there is no other name. There is no power that is even, can even be associated with his. And then Glenn read for us, wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and hath given him a what, church? A name which is above every name that at the name of, or sound of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven, we just sang about it. That, that, that all the angels prostrate fall. On their faces. We read about that in the cloud of first, Second Chronicles chapter 5. And they fell on their, I'm sorry, chapter 7. They fell on their faces because of the person, the presence, the power of the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name. Isn't it amazing in our country, <clears throat> you can walk down the 16th Street Mall and you can yell at the top of your voice the name Allah and people walk by you like you don't even exist. Muhammad, Buddha, no one will say a word, but if you get on a street corner and you say Jesus, you have just committed treason in this country. <laughs> they can handle any other name. They, this, this world system cannot, could not, and never will be able to handle the name of Jesus. Christ. There's just something about that name. About that name. I'm going to mainly preach from Second Chronicles, but would you do me a favor and turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Acts. The book of Acts. Chapter number four, please. <clears throat> Excuse okay, me. I'm on there. This is the story of Peter and John bringing healing to an impotent man, I'm sorry, a lame man who had been impotent and able to walk for over 40 years. And that lame man saw Peter and John coming, not knowing they were preachers, or he never would have asked for alms, because preachers are pro poor. Except for today, my church blessed me with a wonderful love gift in honor of my handsomeness. No, no, in spite of my homeliness, they blessed me with clergy appreciation, went with a beautiful love gift, a beautiful cake. Thank you, church family. But in Acts chapter 4, something out of the ordinary happened. All of the peasants and peons like you and I understood a miracle had just taken place. But the Sanhedrin were angry 
They were angry at Peter and John. And they asked Peter and John, by what name or by what authority did you heal this man? And Peter went on to preach, oh, don't you know Sanhedrin? There is no other name with that kind of power and authority and significance and strength that could bring life into those dead legs than the name of Jesus Christ. They questioned him. They quarantined him. They railed on him. They, they, uh, went, gave, they gave him the third degree. And verse number 15 says, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among them, they talked amongst themselves, saying, What are we going to do to these two guys? For what they did is a notable miracle. We cannot deny it. It's manifested to all of them who dwell in Jerusalem. We can't deny it. We can't quench it. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly or deliberately threaten them that they speak from this point forward. They speak to no man in that name. Peter, you can brag about your name. John, you can brag about your name, but we never, ever, ever, ever want to hear you preaching again in that name. The name of Jesus. Our post-Christian world is much like the Sanhedrin in this day. You can preach in any name you want to, church, except the name of Jesus. And there's a couple reasons for that. The most obvious is it brings conviction. The name of Jesus, it can soften the hardest heart. It can get those people who are on the wrong, the, the broad way that leads to destruction. And many there be that found it. The name of Jesus can bring in hope and healing and repentance and turn around. Only that name can do that, church. The power of that name. The significance of that name. The name of Jesus. This question you can reply to me publicly. Besides myself, is there anyone in this room who ever... Who, who at one time in your life found yourself with your back up against the wall. <laughs> yes, thank you, Donna. And Dean as well. How about on this side? Yes, look at all the hands. This side seems to be more spiritual than, okay, Chuck balanced it out. Diana's smiling now. Yes, we all have been. And after we exhaust our Rolodex and our contact numbers, we've tried everyone in the world we know to help us. We think, oh my goodness, it's that bad. I guess I better pray. And you call on his name. And I'm reminded of the song, he was there all the time. Amen. Amen. Waiting patiently in line. It's about time, Bobby. Why didn't you come to me first? You should know that by now. You're going to be 98 in February. You should have learned your lesson. But no, no, no. I resort to the powers of the... And I know I've got pythons here. We all know that. That's a given, right, Brother George? These arms? I have nothing except the name of Jesus, and he's all I need. He's all you need. <coughs> so, we don't care whose name you preach in Peter and John, except that name. Let's go back to the Old Testament, please. <clears throat> Just two quick thoughts. Chapter 5. It came to pass, my King James starts off in verse 13, 
as the instruments played, as the keyboard was being played and the guitar was being played and the, music, and, and, and the singers sang, that something out of the ordinary took place. What happened, David? About that name. Jesus. There's something about that name. What happened? When praise began, God's presence showed up. showed up. God always inhabits the praises of his people. I'm always leery. Not leery, that's not a good word. Uh, I always wonder why a born-again child of God doesn't like to praise the Lord. Now, I know not all of you were blessed with such a beautiful voice as me or Diana or Papa or what's your name again, Mary Fran? Or Donna. Yeah. I know that. We know that. You're kind of behind the eight ball. But I love to hear men praise the Lord. Whether you sound like a person with nasal drip or not, there's something powerful about praising the name of that name, the name that is above every name. Are you following along with me? Their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and all the instruments of music, and they praise the Lord. They praise from their heart. They praise collectively, and they were saying from good old book of Psalms, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. That then, then, the house was filled with what, church? A class of Jesus. Yes. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That, do you remember the story of the Exodus? How did Jesus, or the Father, manifest himself? for the children of Israel as they marched out of Pharaoh's prison house into the wilderness. During the day, God used a pillar of what? Cloud. To protect them, to go before them. And that's exactly what he wants to do more and more and more with our church family as we praise him. <clears throat> The cathedrals used to sing a little chorus, let's forget about ourselves, magnify the Lord, and what, Mary Fran? Worship, Worship him. But there's, there, there, there's, a, there's an if then, the logical equation here, if we forget about ourselves and magnify the Lord and worship him, he inhabits the praises of his people. That's what happened here. The presence, the presence of a holy God came down upon them. Even upon the house of the Lord. Does it matter how huge, drawn, and magnificent that church building is? No. Not at all. Did you know that this temple that Solomon built was only about 100 feet deep and 30 feet wide. It, it was a man, as a matter of fact, maybe our auditorium is bigger than that entire temple. The size of the building doesn't matter. It's the size of the heart of God's people within the building that matters. Mm -hmm. And he comes down in a cloud representing the very presence of a holy God. Now we know by promise that the Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. So by that promise, he's always here. What made this so different, church? Why was God able to manifest his presence in such a mighty, powerful way that even the priests had to stand back? What was the difference? It was a heart of corporate worship. 
where the only name that was receiving any honor and any blessing and any power and any authority was that name that is above every name. The name of Jesus. There's just something, something about, that name. about that name. And I, I really want to go back to this thought that where there is little praise, there's I mean, where there's a little God, there's little praise. Where there's a great God, there's great praise. It doesn't matter whether it was Paul and Silas singing at midnight, God heard it. And the entire prison, all the gates were open. Why? Because there's something powerful about the name of Jesus and when God's people praise him with all their heart magnificent miraculous things things that can't be explained away begin to happen verse 14 so much so that the preachers could not even stand to minister because of the cloud why because the glory of the Lord had filled his house. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. There's glory on each face. Is it your glory? No. no. It's his glory. It's his Amen. glory. It's his glory. Oh, the glory of his presence. The cloud represents the presence of God manifested through praise, sincere praise, heartfelt praise. Now we turn the page to chapter 7. By the way, chapter 6 begins Solomon's prayer, where he prayerfully dedicates the temple. And then something very interesting. Verse 42 of chapter 6. Oh, Lord God, don't turn your face away from your anointed. Remember your mercies of David, my father and your servant. Remember them. And then verse number one of chapter seven. Now when Solomon had said amen and made an end to his praying, oh my goodness, what happened? Fire. The fire came down. A little bit different than the cloud. Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory of God. Shekinah is not mentioned by that name in the Bible, but it means to rest upon, to cohabitate, to just to be there, to indwell. Shekinah glory of God. There was a burning bush with Moses and there was Shekinah glory. When Elijah called down fire from heaven. And not only were the sacrifices lapped up in all the water in the trench. That's the Shekinah glory of God. The power of God. In the upper room at Pentecost. There was the sound of a mighty rushing wind and There's glory in his presence. There's power in his presence. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. So much so that the priests 
could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And there's only one response for God's people when the glory fills the house. We end up on our faces in the presence of a holy God. I want to encourage Broomfield Community Church as long as we seek his praise, his honor, his glory, Amen. and understand he alone is worthy, God blesses us with his presence. By promise, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I right in the middle of you. But there are special... Remember, we talked about the pillar of cloud by day, and what by night? Fire. Fire. Oh, my goodness. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. The pillar of fire by night. The same fire that accepted the high priest's offering. By the way, just last Saturday, on the Day of Atonement, the Jews celebrated Yom Kippur. No, I don't think there was a sacrifice made. There was no blood offered on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. As a matter of fact, we're not sure where the Ark of the Covenant really is. But we do know this, church. God blesses his people with his presence when we seek his face and have passion in our hearts to glorify him, to honor him, to bless him, to adore him. And I, with all my heart, I pray that when you hear that beautiful name of Jesus mentioned, something inside happens to hold thumper. Your blood pressure goes up a little bit, your heartbeat raises. Because that's our Savior. And above his name, church.